So as many of you know, my name is Emily Graham and I live in Weirdale in County Durham. I personally grew up beating and working in shooting lodges and have been quite involved in the shooting community. Um, I now photograph shoot days and in the past few years I've been looking more and more into how the shooting community actually helps conservation and all of the benefits of the shooting community. So I recently read Merlin Matters, which is Ian Coghill's book, and I'm very lucky today to be able to ask him some questions about it and interview him. So first of all, welcome Ian, and thank you for your time today. Well, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, you're very welcome. So I think to start with, I would like to thank you for your book and tell you it was definitely an inspiration for me to read. Um, it had lots of facts and figures in, which were very helpful to, to hear, and it gave me more hope for the shooting community, I think. So, are you happy with the book? Are you happy with the response to it? Yes, yeah, um, it's been, it's gone down extremely well. They've, they've, they've just told me um, last week that they're doing an extra print of another thousand copies. So, oh, wow. so it's, and the, the shooting community seems to have been um, cheered up by it uh, yeah. because it's actually telling people what people have been telling me for years. Yeah, definitely. I think. Um, before reading it and before hearing all of the hard facts, I I personally felt that the shooting community was was lacking a lot and just not not doing what they should be, not putting the right things out there. So it's almost a script, I think, of what we can do, and it it just gives hope of of what we've achieved already. I think the the, the key thing about it is it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There isn't a wording that's made up. Exactly. There isn't anything that isn't verifiably fact, and and why I wrote it really, and why it's why I wanted to write it, was because it wasn't the shooting. Shooting, I enjoy shooting, and it's important, and and so on. But it's really that these special places, these wonderful, wonderful places, are going to if if we're not careful, they could be be destroyed by mistake. Mm -hmm. And that would be an appalling thing to happen. And if it does happen, and it might at some point in the future occur, then at least there should be a record yeah. that people knew what was going on yeah. and tried to stop it. Yeah, definitely. And that's what me personally, like I've said already, I don't shoot, but I've worked in the shooting community a lot. It's provided me income when I was younger up until now. Um, and I've started making videos and showing all of the wildlife. And for me, that's the main focus is to not lose the habitat, the landscape, and all of the wildlife that depends on that landscape. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it, it, we're not making it up. That landscape is one of the rarest landscapes on the planet, and it has its own special biodiversity, its own special ecology, and that has been kept there by this form of management for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And to change it on a whim, or because somebody just you know, read a new scientific paper that may or may not prove to be true when it's when it's tested over time is just mad. Yes, definitely. Um, so we've probably already covered this slightly, but for your average gamekeeper, picker upper, flanker, anyone who's interested in the shooting industry or just the landscape, what can they proactively do in kind of their day to day life or just small things they can do to make a difference? The first thing that everybody should do is under, understand as much as possible about the arguments that are nece necessary to deploy to defend moorland management yeah. and, and grouse shooting. So they should understand and, and they should try them out on their friends and family. And, and then, and just, if there's a need, then fill it. The people think that because they're one person alone, they can't make a difference. Well, they can. Yeah. And you and that those opportunities occur sometimes infrequently. Sometimes you'll get a run of them. Somebody in a pub is making some disobliging remark about about moorland management or heather burning or something. Just saying, excuse me, I, I don't want to butt in, but that's not entirely right. Mm -hmm. Start a conversation now. If it gets too easy, just walk away. But but try, try. just engage. Yeah. yeah. If you're and if you're a moor owner or, or or employ gamekeepers, then for goodness sake, recognise that um, that gamekeepers engaging with the public, both 
informally during the course of their working day and, and more in a more organised way at helping their regional Moreland group at shows or, 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 or producing, uh, putting stuff on Facebook and so on. That's as an important part of a yeah. gamekeeper's job now mm -hmm. as, as a lot of the normal work would be. Yeah. Because if you don't invest that time now, then you won't have, you'll have all the time in the world later on because you won't be doing it. Exactly. So, and the gamekeepers, and it's, it's fair to say not everybody's good at engaging with the public. Some people just, you know, just can't do it very well. Some people are brilliant. But it is the key to communication, I think, is authenticity mm -hmm. and understanding. And I'll listen to somebody that lays bricks or somebody that uh, mends fuse boxes. Mm -hmm. If they know what they're talking about, yeah. it's always interesting. Mm -hmm. And and gamekeeping on a moor is fascinating. Yeah, it's it's it a wonderful thing. And so it's not difficult to engage the public with it, but you, but it's part of a gamekeeper's job, I'm afraid, now. And even if they can't, you know, even if they feel they can't do it themselves, you can always say, well, all right then. Jeff, you do it and I'll cover for you doing something else. So we need all of us to put our hands to the pump yeah. to try and make things, make the public understand how important it is to keep these beautiful places managed the way they always have been. Yeah. And I think, I mean, one thing I definitely picked up on there, social media can definitely be a negative thing sometimes and can be used negatively, especially against the shooting community. But I see so many younger keepers and head keepers, beaters, flankers, picker uppers, everyone who has put in education out there, you know, they've put in what they do on their day to day life and I think that's a really good thing to just get those small mm. clips of information out there to the public to show that it's not all negative, you know, not everything they hear is true. What the enemy will try and do is dehumanise you. Yeah. That's what they always do. And they, they try and demonise people and dehumanise them and separate them from the rest of humanity. Yeah. So these people, you can just attack, you can say what you like about them. That's what they do. It's not pleasant, but it's a fact. And so everything you can do to get across to the, the general public, and indeed even some of the people that are attacking you, that hang on, I'm not a monster. I've got children. Yeah. I've got a partner. You know, we enjoy watching Manchester United on the football. We're normal people. We just do an unusual job. Yeah. And please don't treat me as though I'm a piece of furniture. Yeah. I'm not. I have feelings. I have worries. I have cares. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the things that are happening to some gamekeepers now are utterly disgraceful. Yeah. I mean, beyond disgraceful. If they were happening to any other uh, cultural minority in this country, mm. the, the people doing it, their feet wouldn't touch the ground. And, and I think that's one thing your book definitely made me realise that, like you say, if this was happening to any other group of people, any other minority, the police would be involved. Yeah. And you have to think these, you know, these people involved in the shooting industry, it's their lifestyle, it's how they make their money, it's how they provide for their family. And I think that needs to be put across as well. If you, if you see some of the things that are being said and done about people, and the, the, the idea that you can put surveillance cameras on covert surveillance cameras on people's family home mm. and that's acceptable you can follow people about during their course of their daily work you can interact with them in an aggressive and unpleasant way throughout their day's work that you can go to places and and see the equipment they use trashed and and, and sometimes put into a position where it's clearly illegal mm. in spite of the fact when it was set it was legal yeah. all of those things are going on on an almost daily basis in some parts of the uplands and and nobody seems to care yeah and that's utterly unacceptable so what i keep saying to people is look don't put up with it that's a crime yeah. report it to the police the police have gone good god if you report all of those we'll never stop yeah you know we'll just be snowed up. well they're crimes the way to stop that is to stop people committing them and it's it, it, what is what i cannot understand is why if you get people, let's say a game who kills 20 stoats mm -hmm. in a year. Okay, he's killed 20 stoats, but he's probably saved a thousand other things yeah. by killing those 20 stoats. Yeah. Somebody else that is quite cheerfully, if you go back to the chicken nuggets, munching their way through 100 chickens in the course of 12 months, 
feels it's perfectly all right to be rude about them. Well, what? it's not. Yeah. I think that's the worst thing. They're, for example, a trap or something, you know, they're changing that to make it illegal when in reality that trap is probably helping the birds and the wildlife that they say they're trying to protect and they say that we're damaging. It's just, it's very contradictory. Well, it, it's, it's, it's really sad mm -hmm. that you've got places which have got some of the best concentrations, well, not some of the best concentrations of ground nesting birds, curlew, lapwing, redshank, snipe, in, in mainland Britain that are purely down to the fact that it's managed that way and that certain common predators are legally controlled. Yeah. Somebody can come in and wreck that yeah. and they're seen as some sort of you know, fighter for environmental justice. No, they're not. Yeah. They're absolutely wrecking the place. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Curlew and Mr. and Mrs. Lapping are going to be grateful yeah. when their chicks are all gone. Mm. And there are places, and it's, it's not supposition, it's, it's verifiable fact. You can see it on the ground if you bother to look. And, and the idea that the people that are making that little demi-paradise can be isolated and demonised, while the people that are doing the isolation and demonising can be lionised, it's dreadful. It's yeah. dreadful. I think that's what's made me, because of COVID really, because I've had more time, I've done the last two nesting seasons, I've sat in hides, I've sat in my car, I've been up every single day to a certain spot where I live and seen, you know, the birds get predated or something happened to the chicks mm. or people's dogs disturb a nest and mm. eat or trash the eggs. And I think it's just putting more education out there and that's what's made me want to do these interviews mm. and do my nesting videos at home. And I've had a lot of good feedback from definitely the shooting community, but also some from people who aren't involved in that and it's definitely educated them a little bit more. Most people just, most people want to go to beautiful places. They don't want to spoil them. Yeah. And, and most of the year you can walk across a moor with a dog running about exactly. and it isn't going to interfere with the wildlife. It might interfere with the livestock, but it won't interfere with the live wildlife because the wildlife flies. Mm -hmm. Disturbance is not mission critical in the winter. No, exactly. Or in, in the autumn. It's mission critical for about two months of the year. Yeah. And it's not to most, well, 99% of the human race and 100% of the sensible ones don't mind. Exactly. If you yeah. explain, look, I'm sorry, but there's between here and that horizon, there's several hundred pairs of curlews, lapwings, and etc. nesting. And, and whilst your dog, I'm sure, is perfectly well behaved, if it, if it just bumps into a baby curlew, the baby curlew will be dead. Yeah. And that, won't be, that will be your fault, but it won't be your intention. Yeah. If you put the dog on a lead, you can stop that happening. Exactly. Please, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And apparently, okay, that sounds all right to me, I'll do it. Definitely. And, you know, we have to find a way, if wildlife is to, is to survive in, in, in an in a accessible landscape, with including ground nesting birds and, and, and some mammals like hares. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way of accommodating uh, large numbers of people because they're, they're going to go. It's, it's, we've got 67 million people in this country. Yeah. We've got a relatively small amount of Heather Moreland. And the 67 million people seem to have a penchant for going there. Yeah. So the Peak District moors get 12 million, 13 million people on them a year. It's a million, pounds, a million people a month. Yeah. Most of the people want to go there in the breeding season. Yeah. You've got a choice. Mm. You either, we either find a way of accommodating those people so that they don't wreck the place, or we just go, can't do anything about it, boys and girls, just let them wreck it. We'll forget the ground nesting birds, we'll forget the mountaineers, we'll forget all that. Yes. Yeah. Well, for goodness sake, the gamekeeping community, the Grace Moor community, thank God, has what are effectively um, wardens, you know, wildlife wardens, covering 90% of that. Yeah. And, and the idea that you, you, instead of seeing that as a positive benefit and using them to, uh, as a resource, you, you demonise them because they kill stoats. It's just mad. Mm -hmm.